Chapter 11 A Knife in the Dark As they prepared for sleep in the inn at Brie, darkness lay on Buckland. A mist strayed in the dells and along the river bank. The house at Crick Hollow stood silent. Fatty Bolger opened the door cautiously and peered out. A feeling of fear had been growing on him all day, and he was unable to rest or go to bed. There was a brooding threat in the breathless night air. As he stared out into the gloom, a black shadow moved under the trees. The gate seemed to open of its own accord and close again without a sound. Terror seized him. He shrank back, and for a moment he stood trembling in the hall. Then he shut and locked the door. The night deepened. There came the soft sound of horses led with stealth along the lane. Outside the gate they stopped, and three black figures entered, like shades of night creeping across the ground. One went to the door, one to the corner of the house on either side, and there they stood. As still as the shadows of stone, while night went slowly on, the house and the quiet trees seemed to be waiting breath breathlessly. There was a faint stir in the leaves, and the cock crowed far away. The cold hour before dawn was passing. The figure by the door moved. In the dark, without a moon or stars, a drawn blade gleamed. As if a chill light had been unsheathed. There was a blow, soft but heavy, and the door shuddered. Open in the name of Mordor, said a voice thin and menacing. Mm -hmm. At the second blow, the door yielded and fell back, with timbers burst and lock broken. The black figures passed swiftly in. At that moment, among the trees nearby, a horn rang out. It rent the night like fire on a hilltop. Awake, fear, fire, foes, awake! Fatty Bolger had not been idle. As soon as he saw the dark shapes creep from the garden, he knew that he must run for it or perish, and run he did, out the back door, through the garden and over the fields. When he reached the nearest house, more than a mile away, he collapsed on the doorstep. No, 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 he was crying. No, not me, I haven't got it. It was some time before anyone could make out what he was babbling about. At last they got the idea that enemies were in Buckland, some strange invasion from the old forest. And then they lost no more time. Fire, fire, foes! The brandy bucks were blowing the horn call of Buckland that had not been sounded for a hundred years not since the white wolves came in the fell winter when the brandy wine was frozen over. Awake, awake! Far away, answering horns were heard. The alarm was spreading. The black figures fled from the house. One of them let fall a hobbit cloak on the step as he ran. In the lane, the noise of hooves broke out and gathering to a gallop, went hammering away into the darkness. All about Crick Hollow, there was the sound of horns blowing and voices crying and feet running, but the black riders rode like a gale to the north gate. Let the little people blow, Sauron would deal with them later. Meanwhile, they had another errand. They knew now that the house was empty and the ring had gone. They rode down the guards at the gate and vanished from the shire. In the early night, Frodo woke from a deep sleep. Suddenly, as if some sound or presence had disturbed him. He saw that Strider was sitting alert in his chair. His eyes gleamed in the fire light, which had been tended and was burning brightly. But he made no sign or movement. Frodo soon went to sleep again, but his dreams were again troubled with the noise of wind and of galloping hooves. The wind seemed to be curling around the house and shaking it, and far off he heard a horn blowing wildly. He opened his eyes and heard a cock crowing justly in the inn yard. 
Strider had drawn the curtains and pushed back the shutters with a clang. The first grey light of day was in the room, and a cold air was coming through the open window. As soon as Strider had roused them all, he led that way to their bedrooms. When they saw them, they were glad they had taken his advice. The windows had been forced open and were swinging, and the curtains were flapping. The beds were tossed about and the bolsters slashed and flung upon the floor. The brown mat was torn to pieces. Strider immediately went to fetch the landlord. Poor Mr. Butterbur looked sleepy and frightened. He had hardly closed his eyes all night, so he said, but he had never heard the sound. Never such a thing happened in my time, he cried, raising his hands in horror. Guests unable to sleep in their beds and good bolsters ruined and all. What are we coming to? Dark times, said Strider. But for the present you may be left in peace when you have got rid of us. We will leave at once. Never mind about breakfast. A drink and a bite standing will have to do. We shall be packed in a few minutes. Mr. Butterbur hurled, hurried off to see that their ponies were got ready and to fetch them a bite. But very soon he came back in dismay. The ponies had vanished. The stable doors had all been opened in the night and they were gone. Not only Mary's ponies, but every other horse and beast in the place. Frodo was crushed by the news. How could they hope to reach Rivendell on foot, pursued by mounted enemies? They might as well set out for the moon. Strider sat silent for a while, looking at the hobbits, as if he were weighing up their strength and courage. Ponies would not help us to escape horsemen, he said at last, thoughtfully, as if he guessed what Frodo had in mind. We should not go much slower on foot, not on the roads that I mean to take. I was going to walk in any case. It is the food and stores that trouble me. We cannot count on getting anything to eat between here and Rivendell, except what we take with us. And we ought to take plenty to spare, for we may be delayed or forced to go roundabout far out of the direct way. How much are you prepared to carry on your backs? As much as we must, said Pippin with a sinking heart, but trying to show that he was tougher than he looked or felt. I can carry enough for two, Sam, said Sam defiantly. Can't anything be done, Mr. Butterbur, asked Frodo. Can't we get a couple of ponies in the village or even one just for the baggage? I don't suppose we could hire them, but we might be able to buy them, he added, doubtfully wondering if he could afford it. I doubt it, said the landlord unhappily. The two or three riding ponies that there were in Bree were stabled in my yard, and they're gone. As for other animals, horses or ponies for draft or what not, there are very few of them in Bree, and they won't be for sale. But I'll do what I can. I'll rout out Bob and send him round as soon as may be. Yes, said Strider reluctantly, you had better do that. I am afraid we shall have to try to get one pony at least. But so ends all hope of starting early and slipping away quietly. We must as well have blown the horn to announce our departure. That was part of their plan, no doubt. There is one crumb of comfort, said Mary, and more than a crumb, I hope. We can have breakfast while we wait and sit down to do it. Let's get hold of Nob. In the end, there was more than three hours delay. Bob came back with the report that no horse or pony was to be got for love or money in the neighborhood, except one. Bill Fernie had one that he might possibly sell. A poor old half-starved creature it is, said Bob but he won't part with it for less than thrice it's worth, seeing how you're placed, not if I knows Bill Fernie. Bill Fernie, said Frodo, is that some trick? Wouldn't the beast bolt back to him with all our stuff, or help in tracking us or something? 
I wonder, said Strider, but I cannot imagine any animal running home to him once it got away. I fancy this is only afterthought of kind Master Fermi's, just a way of increasing his profits from the affair. The chief danger is that the poor beast is probably at death's door, but there does not seem any choice. What does he want for it? Bill Fermi's price was 12 silver pennies. That was indeed at least three times the pony's value in those parts. It proved to be a bony, underfed, and dispirited animal, but it did not look like dying just yet. Mr. Butterbur paid for it himself and offered Mary another 18 pence in some compensation for the lost animals. He was an honest man, and well off as things were reckoned in Brie, but 30 silver pennies was a sore blow to him, and being cheated by Bill Fernie made it harder to bear. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, he came out on the right side in the end. It turned out later that only one horse had been actually stolen. The others had been driven off or had bolted in terror and were found in different corners of Breland. Mary's ponies had escaped altogether and eventually, having a good deal of sense, they made their way to the downs in search of Fatty Lumpkin. So they came under the care of Tom Bombadil for a while and were well off. But when the news of the events at Bree came to Tom's ears, he sent them to Mr. Butterbur, who thus got five good beasts at a very fair price. They had to work harder in Bree, but Bob treated them well. So on the whole, they were lucky. They missed a dark and dangerous journey. But they never came to Rivendell. However, in the meanwhile, for all Mr. Butterbur knew, his money was gone for good or for bad, and he had other troubles. For there was a great commotion as soon as the remaining guests were astir and heard news of the raid on the inn. The southern travelers had lost several horses and blamed the innkeeper loudly, until it became known that one of their own number had also disappeared in the night none other than Bill Fernie's squint-eyed companion. Suspicion fell on him at once. If you pick up with a horse thief and bring him to my house, said Butterbur angrily, you ought to pay for all the damage yourselves and not come shouting at me. Go and ask Fernie where your handsome friend is. But it appeared that nobody's friend and nobody could recollect when he had joined their party. After their breakfast, the hobbits had to repack and get together further supplies for the longer journey they were now expecting. It was close to 10 o'clock before they at last got off. By that time, the whole of Brie was buzzing with excitement. Frodo's vanishing trick, the appearance of the black horseman, the robbing of the stables, and not least the news that Strider the ranger had joined the mysterious hobbits made such a tale as would last for many uneventful years. Most of the inhabitants of Brie and Staddle, and many even from Combe and Archette, were crowded in the road to see the travelers start. The other guests in the inn were at doors and hanging out of the windows. Strider had changed his mind and had decided to leave Brie by the main road. Any attempt to set off across country at once would only make matters worse. Half the inhabitants would follow them to see what they were up to and to prevent them from trespassing. They said farewell to Nob and Bob and took leave of Mr. Butterbur with many thanks. I hope we shall meet again some day when things are merry once more, said Frodo. I should like nothing better than to stay in your house in peace for a while. They tramped off, anxious and downhearted, under the eyes of the crowd. Not all the faces were friendly, nor all the words that were shouted, but Strider seemed to be held in awe by most of the Brelanders, and those that he stared at shut their mouths and drew away. He walked in front with Frodo, next came Mary and Pippin, and last came Sam leading the pony, 
which was laden with as much of their baggage as they had the heart to give it. But already it looked less dejected, as if it approved of the change in its fortunes. Sam was chewing an apple thoughtfully. He had a pocket full of them, a parting present from Nob and Bob. Apples for walking and a pipe for sitting, he said, but I reckon I'll miss them both before long. The hobbits took no notice of the inquisitive heads that peeped out of doors or popped over walls and fences as they passed, but as they drew near to go further gate, Frodo saw a dark, ill-kept house behind a thick hedge, the last house in the village. In one of the windows he caught a glimpse of a sallow face with a sly, slanting eyes, but it vanished at once. So that's where the southerner is hiding, he thought. He looks more than half like a goblin. Over the hedge, another man was staring boldly. He had heavy black brows and a dark, scornful eyes. His large mouth curled in a sneer. He was smoking a short black pipe. As they approached, he took it out of his mouth and spat. Morning, Longshanks, he said, off early. Found some friends at last? Strider nodded, but did not answer. Good morning, my little friends, he said to the others. I suppose you know who you've taken up with. That stick a knot Strider. That is, though I've heard other names not so pretty. Watch out tonight. And you, Sammy, don't go ill-treating my poor pony, Pa. He spat again. Sam turned quickly, and you, Fernie, he said, put your ugly face out of sight or it will get hurt. With a sudden flick, quick as lightning, an apple left his hand and hit Bill square on the nose. He ducked too late and the curses came from behind the hedge. Waste of a good apple, said Sam regretfully and strode on. <laughs> At last they left the village behind. The escort of children and stragglers that had followed them got tired and turned back at the south gate. Passing through, they kept on along the road for some miles. It had been to the left, curving back into its eastward line as it rounded the feet of Bray Hill. And then it began to run swiftly downwards into wooded country. To their left, they could see some of the houses and hobbit holes of Staddle on the gentler southeastern slopes of the hill. Down in a deep hollow, away north of the road, there were wisps of rising smoke that showed where Combe lay. Our chet was hidden in the trees beyond. After the road had run down some way and had left Bray Hill standing tall and brown behind, they came on a narrow track led off towards the north. This is where we leave the open and take to cover, said Strider. Not a shortcut, I hope, said Pippin. Our last shortcut through the woods nearly ended in disaster. Ah, uh, but you had not got me with you then, laughed Strider. My cuts, short or long, don't go wrong. He took a look up and down the road. No one was in sight, and he led the way quickly down towards the wooded valley. His plan, as far as they could understand it without knowing the country, was to go towards Archette at first, but to bear right and pass it on the east, then to steer as straight as he could over the wild lands in Weathertop Hill. In that way, they would, if all went well, cut off a great loop of the road which further bent southwards to avoid the Midgewater march marshes. But of course, they would have to pass through the marshes themselves, and Strider's description of them was not encouraging. However, in the meanwhile, walking was not unpleasant. Indeed, if it had not been for the disturbing events of the night before, they would have enjoyed this part of the journey better than any up to that time. The sun was shining clear, but not too hot. The woods in the valley were still leafy and full of color, and seemed peaceful and wholesome. Strider guided them confidently. 
among the many crossing paths, although left to themselves, they would soon have been at a loss. He was taking a wandering course with many turns and doublings to put off any pursuit. Bill Fernie will have to watch where he left the road for certain, he said, though I don't think he will follow us himself. He knows the land round here well enough, but he knows he is not a match for me in the woods. It is what he may tell others that I am afraid of. I don't suppose they are far away. If they think we have made for our chat, so much the better. Whether because of Strider's skill or for some other reason, they saw no sign and heard no sound of any other living thing all that day. Neither two-footed, except birds, nor four-footed, except one fox and a few squirrels. The next day, they began to steer a steady course eastward, and still all was quiet and peaceful. On the third day out from Bree, they came out of the Chetwood. The land had been falling steadily ever since they turned aside from the road, and they now centered a wide, flat expanse of country, much more difficult to manage. They were far beyond the borders of Bree land, out in the pathless wilderness, and drawing near to the Midgewater marshes. The ground now became damp, and in places boggy, and here and there they came upon pools and wide stretches of reeds and rushes, filled with the warbling of little hidden birds. They had to pick their way carefully to keep both dry-footed and on their proper course. At first they made fair progress but as they went on, their passage became slower and more dangerous. The marshes were bewildering to find through their shifting quagmires. The flies began to torment them, and the air was full of clouds of tiny midges that crept up their sleeves and breeches and into their hair. I am being eaten alive, cried Pippin. Midge water. There are more midges than water. What do they live on when they can't get hobbit? asked Sam, scratching his neck. They spent a miserable day in this lonely and unpleasant country. Their camping place was damp, cold, and uncomfortable, and the biting insects would not let them sleep. There were also abominable creatures haunting the reeds and tussocks, and from the sound of them were evil relatives of the cricket. There were thousands of them, and they squeaked all round, neek, breek, neek, breek, breek, neek, unceasingly, all the night, until the hobbits were nearly frantic. The next day, the fourth, was little better, and the night almost as comfortless. Though the neeker breakers, as Sam called them, had been left behind, the midges still pursued them. As Frodo lay tired and unable to close his eyes, it seemed to him that far away there came a light in the eastern sky. It flashed and faded many times. It was not the dawn, for that was still some hours off. What is the light, he said to Strider, who had risen and was standing gazing ahead into the night. I do not know, Strider answered. It is too distant to make out. It is like lightning that leaps up from the hilltops. Frodo lay down again, but for a long while he could still see white flashes, and against them the tall dark figure of Strider standing silent and watchful. At last he passed into uneasy sleep. They had not gone far on the fifth day, when they left the last straggling pools and reed beds of the marshes behind them. The land before them began steadily to rise. Away in the distant eastward, they could now see a line of hills. The highest of them was at the right of the line and a little separated from the others. It had a conical top, slightly flattened at the summit. That is Weathertop, said Strider, the old road, which we have left far away 
on our right runs to the south of it and passes not far from its foot. We might reach it by noon tomorrow if we go straight towards it. I suppose we had better do so. What do you mean? asked Frodi. I mean, when we do get there, it is not certain what we shall find. It is close to the road. But surely we were hoping to find Gandalf there. Yes, but the hope is faint. If he comes this way at all, he may not pass through Bree, so he may not know what we are doing. And anyway, unless by luck we arrive almost together, we shall miss one another. It will not be safe for him or for us to wait there long. If the riders fail to find us in the wilderness, they are likely to make for Weathertop themselves. It commands a wide view all around. Indeed, there are many birds and beasts in this country that could see us as we stand here from that hilltop. Not all the birds are to be trusted, and there are other spies more evil than they are.